If you're an up-and-coming CSS developer and you're ready to learn about CSS layouts, then start here. In this installation of our Start Here series, you're going to learn all about controlling layouts with CSS. The first thing that we'll do is take a sneak peek at the layout that you'll be creating throughout this course and running you through why we're using the REM unit to control our layout. Then we'll move into learning about all of the properties that control layout in the CSS. Those that control sizing, alignment, spacing, and responsiveness. We'll begin with sizing, where you'll learn about all the different width and height properties that you can work with. From there, we'll move on to alignment, where you'll learn about floating and clearing, as well as the text align property and the difference between block and inline elements. From there, we'll get into spacing CSS. You'll learn about margins and padding, about applying borders, and also how the box sizing property can make your life much easier when creating CSS layouts. And then finally, you'll take the layout that you've put together and you'll make it responsive by adding media queries and adjusting your columns, spacing, and text sizing. By the end of this course, you'll have taken some raw HTML and applied a fully responsive CSS-driven layout to it. So let's go ahead and start here and learn layout CSS. I'll see you in the first lesson. Hey, I'm Kez Bracey for Tuts Plus. Welcome to the first lesson of Start Here, Learn CSS Layout. Now, before we actually hook into coding, I want to give you a little preview of the layout that you're going to be creating. Now, along with the source files that you get access to as part of this course, you'll find a little package in there that gives you all the starter files that you need to kick off this course with. And what we've got is the HTML that you've been working on so far with the content modified a little bit and a style sheet with the styles that you created in the last course on typography already inside. The content you'll be starting out with looks like this, and you'll be adding in layout code so that you end up with this. So you'll have a header with the logo in it. You'll have a two column layout. You'll have a little frame around this image here, and you'll have a footer with some centered text. You'll also have appropriate spacing all the way throughout the design. And if you shrink down the window, you'll see that the layout adapts so that it still looks good no matter what size window you're working with. Now, the reason that I'm showing you this now is because as we go through our coding, all of our layout specifications are going to be done using the REM unit. And you should remember from our typography course that a REM unit is a multiple of the root font size for your page. The REM unit is useful not just for typography, but also for your layout. And I'm going to show you why you should use REM units when you're setting up your layout. Now, I'll just scroll down a little bit so you can see the area that is controlled by our text. And I'm just going to grab the settings, scroll down to show advanced settings, and then we're looking for our font settings. We're just going to hit customize fonts and just drag that out so we can see what we're working with a little bit more easily. Now, if I bump up the font size of our browser, you'll see the font size change in the site. I'm just gonna pull this off screen so you can see a little bit more clearly. Now, if I keep increasing the font size and I just refresh, now you can see that the whole layout has adapted so that at this larger font size, everything is still readable. And that's possible because by using REM units to set out our entire layout, everything can be flexible depending on the root font size of our document, which comes, as you remember from our previous courses, from the browser settings. So in the same sense, if I decrease our font size back to a really small size, and I'll just refresh once again to let the browser just reflow that, you can see that the whole layout has shrunk down once again. I'll just put that back to the default of 16. So by using these REM units, we make sure that when a user changes their font size, not only does the text itself change to suit, but so too does the entire layout. Now, I just wanted to step you through that before we got into the rest of the course, so that as we go through and start entering our dimensions that we'll be working with and our spacing sizes and everything else, you'll know why we're using REM units rather than pixel units. All right, so now that you're aware of that, we're ready to move on and get started with our coding. Now, there are basically four different aspects to layout CSS, and they are sizing, so controlling the height and width of something, spacing, controlling the amount of spacing that an element has around its interior and around its outside, alignment, so whether something is on the left side or the right side or the center, and responsiveness, making sure that your layout can respond to the size of viewport that it's being looked at through. 
and remain readable and easy to digest no matter what the dimensions of the viewport are. So in the next lesson, you're going to start learning about sizing. We're going to look at three types of width property, and they are width, min width, and max width. And we're also going to look at three height properties. We'll be looking at height, min height, and max height. So I'll see you in the next lesson. Hey, welcome back to Start Here, Learn Layout CSS. In this lesson, you're going to learn all about sizing in CSS. Now, we are going to be applying some sizing to our HTML here and getting our layout underway. But before we do, I just want to give you a quick run through of the six different types of sizing property that we'll be looking at in this lesson. There are three that affect height and three that affect width. All right, so over here, we've just got a blank HTML page. Inside it, we have nothing but just an empty div. This div already has a little CSS applied to it. It just has a red background. However, you can't see this div right now. So let's just inspect our HTML. And if we go into our body section, here is our div. So we can see in our code that it's there and yet we cannot see it on the page. But if we look at this little layout representation here, it's telling us in the second number on the right that the div has no height. It has a height of zero. So that's why it's currently invisible. So to fix that, we're gonna use the height property. So up in our div style, we're gonna add the property height and let's just give it a value of 10 rem. And there we go, now we can see our div. So right away, you can see the effect of the height property. Now let's have a look at the width property too. Now right now I don't want this div to just be filling up the entire browser window. I wanna bring it down so it's not quite as wide. So this time we're gonna add the property width. And now let's give this a value of 15 rem. All right, so now we've brought in our width of our div. Now, as well as setting a specific height and width like we have here with our 10 rem and 15 rem, you can also use percentages. And these can be really great for creating responsive layouts. So layouts that can adjust themselves to suit any viewport size. So let's see what happens if we change the width from 15 rem to 50%. All right, so now our div is exactly 50% the width of the viewport, but this is not a fixed size anymore. Now, if I increase the size of the viewport, the div also increases. And you'll see why that's really helpful and really important as we go through and lay out our page. So height and width are the most fundamental sizing properties that you'll be working with, but sometimes they're not enough to achieve what you need to do by themselves. You can also combine into the mix the min width and min height properties and max height and max width properties. Now let me show you an example. So I'm just temporarily going to change the width of this div to a fixed amount, let's say 50 rem. Now if the browser window is wider, we can see the whole div, but as the browser window gets shorter, we can't see the whole div anymore. And we have this scroll bar that appears along the bottom. So what do I do if I want this div to be adjustable like we just saw with our 50% width div so that I don't have this scroll bar along the bottom, but I still don't want it to be any wider than this when the viewport is larger. And what we can do is change our width to 100%. So now that's gotten rid of our scroll bar. And then we can add the max width property and set that to 50 rem. Rather than having the width set to 50 rem, we're now setting the max width to 50 rem. So save those changes and no scroll bar has appeared at the bottom. But if we increase the size of our window, now the div still doesn't get any larger than that 50 rem amount. So we're using both of these together to allow us to control the width of our div and still keep it flexible at the same time. So that's an example of how you can leverage a maximum setting on your sizing. And the max height property, which just looks like this, works in the same way. So I won't do a demo of that just to save a little time. Then the other type of property to consider is a min property. You can set a min height and you can also set a min width. Now let's look at an example of min height in action. Now right now, our div is set with a fixed height of 10 rem. Now watch what happens if we add a little content inside the div. 
Now, because it has a fixed height, all of the content that we've added has flowed outside of the div. So what we can do here, instead of using a fixed height of 10 rem, we can set a min height of 10 rem. So we'll change that so that it reads min height. And now the div has the ability to expand out to whatever height it needs to. If we take the content out again, the div will still get no less than 10 rem in height so that we don't have that problem of an empty div being invisible like it was when we started out. But because it's only a minimum height, that means that it still has the ability to expand in size if it needs to. So just like with the max settings, with the min setting, you can have min height and you can also have min width, which once again works in a similar way. So just to recap, you've got height and width, you've got min height and min width, and you've got max height and max width. All right, now let's take those properties and use them to start controlling the layout of our HTML page. All right, so here's the CSS we're beginning with. This is almost exactly the same CSS that you ended up with at the end of the previous course on typography. The only difference is the wrapper class has been removed from the top of this file, and that's because we're gonna recreate that wrapper class ourselves so that you understand all of the code that it contains. Now, before we get started on our sizing code, there's just one little piece of housekeeping that we need to do. You'll notice here that we have a heading, even though we have a logo that says the same thing. Now, this heading is here purely to create a proper HTML5 outline. And you should remember we touched briefly on HTML5 outlines in the first course in this series on HTML basics. So you can see the heading has been picked up here in our HTML outline. But because we have this logo here, we don't want to see this heading. So we're just going to drop in a little snippet of CSS that we're going to use to hide that. Now, you don't need to understand this CSS right now but just for the sake of having things done properly, just paste this snippet into your code. And then we already have this class hidden applied to the heading there. So this will just take care of hiding that heading for you. All right, now moving on. And the first thing we're gonna do is create a new wrapper class, just like we've had in all the previous lessons so far. And we're gonna use this wrapper to set the maximum width of our content. Now right now I'm recording at 1280 by 720 because it makes it easier for you to see what I'm working on. But because our wrapper class is gonna be setting the maximum width, I'm gonna to need to show you a full size monitor space. So you're about to see things shrink down a little bit in this video. All right, so now we're at 1920 by 1080 and I'm just going to blow up this browser to full size. And you can see that the content that we're working with is going far too wide. So the first thing that we're gonna do is gonna set the maximum width that our website can ever go to. And we're gonna set that to 80 rem. So in your CSS, we'll add the wrapper class. And we're gonna use the same trick that we just did on our red div before. So we're gonna add a width of 100%. And we're gonna add a max width of 80 rem. Now, when the browser is full width, we don't see the content stretching all the way across the page. So it never gets any wider than 80 rem. But because we've used a flexible percentage in there as well, we can shrink the window down as narrow as we like and the site is able to adapt accordingly. All right, so now let's add in our column width. If we look in our HTML, we have the class col underscore zero one on our section here and we have col underscore zero two on our aside. So let's add in those selectors. We'll add col underscore zero one, and we're gonna set the width of that to 62.5%. Then we'll add col underscore zero two, and we'll set this width to 37.5%. So I'll just blow this up again so you can see it. All right, so now our main content column is at a really good width so that you're not straining your eyes by having to read lines that are too long. Now our aside down here is going to become the right hand column when we move on to working with alignment. So it is going to sit up here on the right side. So its width is purely designed to take up the rest of the space inside our wrapper. And then as we crunch down the browser size, you'll see that each of our columns is flexible. And that is because we use percentage based widths 
so that these columns can always respond to the width of the viewport. All right, so with those basic widths in, I'm just going to switch back to our regular video size. All right, so now we've got our sizing in place for our wrapper and for what's to become our two columns. But there's still one more thing that has sizing that's not quite right, and that is the image that we have here, which is placed at the top of the aside. And because this image is inside what is to become our sidebar or our second column, we only ever want its width to be equal to the width of this column. And the way we're going to make sure that happens is by setting a max width on all images that are used in this site. So in our CSS, up the top here, now you'll notice that we've got all of our selectors at the top are elements, and then all our custom selectors are below that. That just helps to keep your CSS organized. So up with the rest of the elements, we're gonna add an image selector, and then we're gonna set a max width of 100%. So now, the browser has detected that the width of this image should be no greater than 100% of the container it's sitting inside. And if we inspect our element, you can see the size of our column and you can see that the image is fitting perfectly inside it. Now, the other thing that you want to do whenever you're setting a max width on an image is to also set its height. But here we're going to use a property of auto. By setting an automatic height, what that does is it retains the correct aspect ratio for any image that gets resized by the browser. Now this snippet right here is technically a part of your responsive coding, which we will be covering in more depth in a later lesson. And you wanna make sure that you include that snippet in every single one of your websites. And then you'll make sure that all of your images are responsive. All right, so now that is everything that we need to do right now for sizing with our layout right here. And in the next lesson, we're going to move on to alignment. So we're going to take our aside and shift it up to the right hand of the screen here. And we're going to align our logo and our footer content. So I'll see you in the next lesson. Hi, welcome back to Start Here, Learn CSS Layout. In this lesson, we're going to go through controlling alignment. Now with this topic, the best thing is to just jump right in and start showing you how it's all done by applying the correct alignment to our site that we've been working on so far. And the first thing that we're gonna do is we're going to turn our main section of content here and our side here into two side-by-side -side columns. So in the CSS that we've been working on so far, we're gonna go down and we're gonna find the classes that we have already put in place to set up the width of our two columns. Now, there are a few different ways that you can handle creating columns, but we're going to be using something of a classic method, probably still the most common method of creating columns, and that is using floating. And when you float an element, what you're doing is you're pulling it out of the regular document flow and you're telling it to position itself either over on the left side or the right side. So I'll show you how that looks in action. Our first column, we want it to go over to the left side and we want the second column to go over to the right side. So we're going to add the property float and our first column, we'll set the value left. In our second column, we're going to do the same thing. We'll add the property float and then we'll add the value right. And we'll save that and you'll see the effect. All right, so there is our two column layout. We've got our first column sitting over here on the left and we've got our second column sitting over here on the right. Now you could alternatively change the values of these float properties swapping them around. And then your columns would swap sides. So using the float property for alignment is quite flexible in that way. So we'll just undo that. Now there's something that you need to be aware of when you're working with floating. And that is, as I mentioned earlier, when you apply the float property to an element, you pull it out of the regular document flow. And what that means is it can have a funny effect on other elements that are around floated elements. So if we have a look down here, we can see now that our footer is over here. It sort of bumped itself over onto the right hand side instead of being down below both of these columns where we want it. And that's because the floated elements that are before it in the document have kind of confused the footer and now it doesn't know exactly where it ought to be. 
So the way to remedy that is that every time you use the float property, you need to do something called clearing immediately after the last floated element that you've used. So you can kind of consider it as being like ruling a line underneath your floated elements so that after that, all the other elements can just behave in their normal way. I'm going to show you two ways to do this. One is a kind of an old-fashioned way, but it's a bit easier to show you how clearing works. And then I'll show you the more current way once you know how clearing operates. All right, so in our CSS, we're going to add a new class and we're going to name it clear. Inside that, we're going to add the property clear. Now, this property can take the values left, right, or both. You'll use the value left if you only have elements floated to the left that you're trying to deal with. You'll use the value right if you only have elements floated to the right that you're trying to deal with. If you have both, as we do here, then you use the value both. Now in our HTML, this is our first floated element. This is our second floated element. So after the two of those, we're going to create just an empty div, just purely to give us something that we can apply our clear class to. So we'll add in our empty div, and then we'll add the class clear. And now our footer is back where it's supposed to be. Rather than being popped up here, it's down the bottom, back into its normal position. So that shows you how clearing works, but there is a better way to handle clearing. In our HTML here, we have this div that isn't really useful for anything. The HTML itself doesn't have a part in our layout. So it's better for us if we can just get rid of this HTML. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to use a method of clearing that doesn't require us to add extra markup. And then delete that clear class as well. Instead, I want you to look into your source files and look for the class in the CSS files that are provided, clearfix. And then I want you to copy and paste in this snippet. Now, some of what you're looking at here is going to be a little bit more advanced than you really need to be thinking about right now. So don't worry about understanding exactly what this code is doing. If you want to look it up in your own time, what we're doing here is working with pseudo elements, the before and the after pseudo elements. And basically what this does is it creates an imaginary element that's not really there. So it allows us to basically do what we just did by creating an empty div, but that element doesn't really exist anywhere other than in CSS. So as I said, don't worry too much if you don't understand exactly how that all works right now. All you really need to know for the moment is to use this snippet of code whenever you're using floated elements. And then here's how you apply it. So our class is clear fix. And what you want to do is apply that class to the parent of your floated elements. So we've got our side element and our section element. And their parent is this main element. So we'll add in class equals clear fix. And there we go. We have the same effect. So we're still clearing after our two floated elements, but we haven't had to add any extra HTML to make that happen. All right, so we've got our left and our right columns sorted out, but right now our whole site is actually still aligned over to the left. I'm just going to zoom this out so you can see what I'm talking about. Here you can see that our wrapper div that surrounds our two columns is just aligned off to the left, which is the default. And what we want to do is position it in the center. And we're going to do that with the most common method of centering divs. I'll show you what that is. So right here, we have our wrapper div, and we're actually going to center it using margins. And we talked about margins in the last course on typography, and you learned that margins create external spacing around elements. And we're also going to go into margins in depth more in the next lesson. But for now, all you need to know is that because margins can be used to create external space, we can have them set an equal amount of space on the left and right side of an element, thereby centering it. So what we're going to do is first we're going to set the margin on the left side. And we'll do that with the property margin hyphen left. And we're going to set that with a value of auto. Now we'll do the same thing for the right side with the property margin hyphen right. And we'll also set that to auto. Now that auto property is going to tell the browser to just automate the amount of margin that are on the left and right sides 
to an equal width, and that will center our wrapper. So let's see. All right, so now we have our centered wrapper. Now there's actually a shorthand that you can use. Instead of writing out both of these margin left and margin right properties, we can just write margin zero auto. And what that does is the first value here of zero says that both the top and bottom margins should be zero. And the second value of auto says both the left and right margins should be auto. And that little snippet of code is the most common way of centering div elements and other elements like it. Okay, now that we've got our wrapper element centered, we also want to center the header and footer content. So we have the logo in our header and we have this little bit of text in our footer. And now that we're zoomed back in, things are going to look a little bit cramped when I put this over on the right side of the screen. But don't worry, we're going to be fixing that in a later lesson. Now you might think that centering our header and footer content could be done in the same way that we just centered our wrapper with this little snippet of code. However, that won't actually work. And the reason is our div element is a different type of element to our image and the text in our footer. The div element is something that we call a block and the image and the text are something that we call inline elements. Now, the easiest way to remember what an inline element is, is to think of it as referring to any kind of content that you can put in line in a body of text. So inline elements are text and anything that behaves kind of like text does by default. Now I'll show you how we center these two inline elements and you'll start to get an idea of the difference. So up in our section of CSS that we're using to apply to just plain elements, we're gonna add the selector header to target our header. We'll add a comma and then we'll add the selector footer. And this is gonna let us target the content that's inside both of these. Now all inline elements behave like text, whether they're text or not. And because of that, we can center these elements by using the property text align. So we'll add text hyphen align, and then we'll add the value center. And now when we save, you'll see both the header and the footer content center itself. So our logo is centered at the top and our footer text is centered at the bottom. So basically, if you have an inline element, then you should use the text align property to determine its alignment. You can also set this property to right or to left. And as you would imagine, the property can apply to any text at all. So we'll just center our heading here to give an example, we'll add the H1 selector. And now our H1 heading is also centered. But if you have block elements, text align center will not affect them. And that's why with our block elements, like our wrapper div, we need to use margins. Now, if you're not sure whether an element is a block element or an inline element, then you can inspect the element, go into the computed tab, and then look for the display property. So here we see that our logo image is set to display inline, meaning it's an inline element. Our wrapper div, on the other hand, is set to display block, meaning it's a block element. So looking for that display property will help you decide which method you need to use to set the alignment of an element. Okay, so we've now done everything that we need to do with our site for alignment. You've seen how you can center block elements using margins, and you've seen how you can center or otherwise align inline elements using the text align property. And you've also seen a little of the difference between a block element and an inline element. And with our columns, you saw how to set a column on the left or right side using the float property. And there is another way to do this that we haven't touched on here because it's probably just a little bit more advanced than you really want to be thinking about right now. However, it's definitely something you should look into in your own time, and that is Flexbox. Now, compared to using floats, Flexbox is somewhat of a newer method of controlling alignment in CSS. However, it is now fairly well established, and it lets you get around some of the quirks of just using floating to control layout. Now, these quirks are probably not something you're going to run into right away, but as you move on and you start doing more advanced layouts, it's very likely that you will run into some of the shortcomings of working with floats. So when you're ready, start having a look into Flexbox. And of course, don't forget to check out Tuts Plus for some excellent resources that will help you learning along the way.
All right, so now our alignment is all set up and so is our sizing. But as you can see, everything right now is pretty cramped. And that's because we still need to set up the spacing in our layout. And that's what we're going to be doing in the next lesson. We're going to go through how to use the margin and padding properties in your layout. And we're also going to cover implementing borders and how you can work with the box sizing property to make controlling your layouts a lot easier. So I'll see you in the next lesson. Hi, welcome back to Start Here, Learn CSS Layout. In this lesson, you're going to learn all about spacing in CSS. And we're going to start with a demo of how the margin and padding properties work. So here we have three divs. Each one is nested inside the other. And in the inspector, we can see that the parent div has a background color of green, the middle div has a background color of blue, and the child div has a background color of red. And right now we can only see the child div because all of our divs are the exact same size. So what we're going to do is modify the margin and the padding of the middle div to allow us to see all three of these divs. Margin and padding are the two properties that you will use most frequently when you're controlling the spacing in your layouts. A margin affects the spacing around the outside of an element and padding affects the spacing around the inside of an element. So the first thing that we're going to do is set the margins on our middle div to create some space around its outside. So inside our middle div, we'll add the property margin and we'll set it to one rem. All right, so now that we have some space around the outside of our middle div, we can see our parent div. However, we still can't see the blue color of the middle div itself because the child div that's sitting inside it is still obscuring it. So now let's add some spacing around the inside of our middle div. And we'll do that by adding the property padding. And we'll also give that a value of one rem. So there we go. Now we have some spacing around the inside of our middle div as well, allowing us to see all three of our divs. And in the inspector, if you click on the middle div, you'll see in the little representation of the layout down in the right corner here, it shows that we have a margin around the outside and padding around the inside. Now, when you just use the straight margin or padding property, the value that you provide will be set on all sides of that element. However, you can set sides one at a time, and that's done by appending hyphen top, hyphen right, hyphen bottom, or hyphen left. So let's change our middle div so we only have a margin at the top. So there we go, all the other margins have disappeared and we only have a margin at the top here. And we can do the same thing with our padding. Let's change this so we only have padding on the left side. So now we only have this space on the left side of our div. Now, as well as appending hyphen and then the side that you want to target, you can also use shorthand and put a different size margin on every side of your element. So I'll show you what I mean. Here, I'm going to put in four numbers, one rem, two rem, three rem, and four rem. And now you can see we have a different amount of spacing on every side of our element. So the way to remember how this shorthand works is it starts at the top and it goes clockwise. So in this example, our padding is one rem at the top, two rem on the right, three rem on the bottom, and four rem on the side. And you can use this same shorthand with margins as well. And then the last type of shorthand, which you've already seen a couple of times, is we use two numbers. And in this case, the first number will be your spacing at the top and bottom. And the second number will be your spacing at the right and left sides. All right, so that covers how to work with margins and padding. Now let's take that and apply it to our design. Okay, so the first thing that you can see is problematic in our design right now is that there's no spacing on either side of our columns. So there's no spacing on the left side, on the right side, or in the middle in between the two columns. So let's fix that. The first thing that we're gonna do is add padding around the left and right sides, and incidentally also above and below our content by adding padding to our wrapper. So as you'll recall, that will add spacing to the inside. So in our wrapper class, we'll add the padding property and we'll set it to five rem. All right, so that's a good amount of spacing on the left side and also on the right side. 
Now let's add some spacing in between the columns too. And we're going to do that by adding some padding to the left side of our second column. So in our col underscore two class, we're going to add padding left, and we're also going to set that to five rem. All right, so now we do have five rem of padding on the left side of our second column. And I can show you that in the inspector. So there is our padding showing up. However, as you can see, we've got a pretty significant problem. Our right column has just been pushed down below the left column. And our whole site is now too wide. We now need to scroll left and right just to see everything. Now the reason for that is something called the box model. The box model controls how the overall width of an element is calculated. Now by default, a browser will take the width that you have specified for an item and it will add the amounts of the padding that you specify on top of it. So our site here is already specified to be 100% width. And right now the browser is taking our padding and it's adding it on top of that. And obviously that's not what we want. So what we're gonna do is switch the box model so that rather than our padding being added onto our 100% width, it's just factored into it. So first up in our wrapper, we're gonna add the property box sizing. Now the default value that's automatically applied to box sizing of any element is content box. And that's what's causing the problems that we have here. So we're gonna change that to border hyphen box. Then we're gonna take this same code and we're gonna put it down in our second column as well. So there we go, instantly, everything now fits back into our full width, but we have a nice amount of spacing either side of the columns and in between them. Now the next thing that needs spacing is our logo, which is a little too close to the top, and also our footer. And before we do that though, we're gonna add a border that's gonna go all the way around our wrapper. And that's partly for decorative purposes and also partly to help separate visually between our wrapper div and the header and footer. So to add a border in, the first thing that we're gonna do is add the property border style. And we're gonna set that to solid. And there we go, that instantly adds a border around our box. And this is one property that's essential if you wanna make a border show up somewhere in your site. And now we also wanna set that to a width that's gonna suit our design. So now we'll add border hyphen width and we'll set that to a value of 0 0.1875 rem. Now that's just the equivalent to a three pixel width border, but we're using rem for the same reason that we went through in the first video in this course. And that is that if somebody bumps up or shrinks the size of their text, the borders are also going to increase or decrease in size so that they don't look out of place. So now with our borders in, we can see a bit more clearly how the spacing in the header and in the footer should be modified. So up in our header and footer styling here, we're gonna add some padding and we'll set that to two rem. All right, so now that's a much more natural looking amount of space in both the header and the footer. Now there's something else that you'll also notice doesn't look quite right. And that is that there's some unwanted space down the left side and the right side of our border around our wrapper. And that is because by default, the browser will add some spacing into your document. So if we check out the body element, you can see that it has eight pixels of margin added. And that's gonna be the case in any fresh HTML document that you create. And it's something that you're always gonna to have to override if you don't want it there. So we're gonna go up into our body styling and we're just gonna set the margin to zero. And there we go, now that's corrected that issue. And now there's just one last thing that we wanna set out with our layout, and that is to put a frame around our image here. It's looking a little plain, so we're gonna change that up a little bit. Now in the HTML that you're working with, we already have a class name applied to the image, and that is image frame. So now we'll set up a style in our CSS for it, 
And what we're going to do is add a border around the outside of the image and some padding. So we'll put some space around the image, creating a frame effect. And because we're adding padding and we've already set the width of this image to a maximum of 100%, we're also going to set the box sizing for this element to border box. So just copy and paste to make things a little quicker. Now we're going to add some padding. We'll set that to 0.75 rem. And then we're going to add the same border that we applied to the outside of our wrapper. All right, so now we've created a nice frame effect for our image. And the only thing that doesn't look quite right now in our layout is that we have quite a bit of space above the heading. You remember from our typography course that we add a margin above and below our headings. But as we already have some spacing inside our wrapper, that makes a little bit too much space. So what we're going to do is target the first element that appears inside our left column, and we're going to get rid of its top margin. So the way that we do that is by creating a new style. First, we're going to specify the class of the first column. Then we're going to add a greater than sign. And this tells the browser to target only children of this column. Then we're going to use a different kind of selector called the first child selector. So we'll add a colon and then we'll add first hyphen child. And that is going to tell the browser to target only the first child inside the left column. Now we'll set its top margin to zero. All right, so now our heading lines up nicely with the top of our image. And the same thing would apply if you had a paragraph at the top of this column instead. Whatever was added first in this left column will have its top margin trimmed off so everything lines up nicely. So now everything is looking nicely spaced out. We've got a good amount of spacing in our header, our columns are all nicely spaced out, our image is looking just right, and so is our footer. And on top of that, we've overridden the default spacing that was putting gaps on the left and right side of our wrapper. So now you've almost fully completed your layout stage. The only thing left to fix is the fact that this is not yet responsive. I'm sure that you will have noticed that as we've had the browser squished over on the right side of the screen, everything looks pretty awful. And that's something that we need to fix. And so far we've been working with our site at its maximum width. And as you start reading up on web design, you'll find that there's some debate over whether you should start a design at its smallest possible width, which is often thought of as being a mobile first design because mobile devices often have smaller screens or its largest size first, which is sometimes referred to as a desktop first approach because desktops usually have larger screens. And what we're doing is not really either. Now I'll just zoom out again to show you what I'm talking about. And with our site, we've started working at this width because this is the maximum width we ever want our site to get to. If this site is any wider, it will become too difficult to read the content in our columns. So we're starting at this width, not because we're specifically trying to create a desktop suitable layout, but because we're trying to establish both ends of the spectrum that our layout needs to suit. So now we have our largest width, and we also know that our smallest width it's just the smallest width that we can crunch a browser window down to. So now that we have both of those extremes, all we need to do is make sure that the layout still looks good everywhere in between those two points. And that's what we'll be doing in the next lesson. You'll learn how to create a smoothly adjusting design that adapts itself to look good at any size viewport. We'll be doing that with media queries as well as a few little extra tweaks. So I'll see you in the next lesson. Hey, welcome to the final lesson of Start Here, Learn CSS Layout. Your layout is almost complete, but in this lesson, we're going to make it responsive. So we're going to make sure that it looks good everywhere in between here at its widest and here at its narrowest. And the general process that you want to follow when you're making your site responsive is to just gradually decrease the width of the viewport. And every time that the layout starts to look wrong or starts to look broken, you add in some code to correct it and make it look good again. And we do that by adding what's called breakpoints or media queries. Now these are a way to detect when a viewport is at a certain width and then to adjust your layout at that width only. Now as we shrink down our browser window, the first time that we'll hit a point that the layout starts to look wrong is when we start to close the browser viewport 
in onto the borders of our wrapper here. What we want to do is add a little spacing into the left and right sides when we're at this width so that our wrapper isn't just smooshed up against the edges of the viewport. So we're going to do this with the video zoomed out a little bit more than it usually is because the width at which we need to make this first change will be too wide for you to see otherwise. Now what we want to do is add some spacing of 2.5 rem on the left and right sides at the point at which we would otherwise start crushing in on those borders. And the way we're going to figure out where our breakpoint should be is by adding the amount of spacing that we want to add in to the width of our wrapper, which is 80 rem. So when we reach a point of 85 rem, which will account for the width of our wrapper plus the padding, then we're going to make our change. And the way that we do that is by adding a media query. So first, we're going to add at media. And this is how we let the browser know that we're about to start a media query. Then we're going to make a pair of brackets. And in between the brackets, we're going to tell the browser at what width we want this media query to take effect. And we only want it to affect our browser up to a maximum width of 85 rem. So in between the brackets, we'll add max width, 85 rem. Now we're going to add some curly brackets. And then in between the curly brackets, we're going to make our adjustment. Now we want to target the body element and we want to give it some extra padding on the left and right sides at this width. So we'll add in body and we're creating a new style to target the body. Then we're going to set our padding. We don't want to change the padding at the top and bottom of the body. So we'll set the first value to zero. And then for the left and right sides, we'll set 2.5 rem. And there we go. So now we've got some nice spacing on the left and right sides. And that spacing will kick in when we get to about here. Now watch for a little jump in the layout. There you go. Did you see that little change there? Just a little shift. That is the media query kicking in and adding in that padding to the body. All right, now I'll just quickly zoom in again so it's a little bit easier for you to see what I'm doing. All right, so the next thing we're going to deal with is our columns. Right now, as we start to crunch down the browser window, you get to a point where there's really not enough space to have two columns side by side. And we're going to choose what point we want to collapse down to a single column layout. So our side will sit below our main section. And a little tip, if you activate the Chrome DevTools, then as you adjust your browser window size, you'll get a little readout in the top right corner that will tell you the width of your viewport. So I think that the point at which we need to collapse our layout down is around about 960 pixels. So that's about the last point at which it still looks okay having those two columns. Now we're gonna convert 960 pixels to a rem value. And the way we do that is by taking the value of 960 and dividing it by 16, which is the most common default browser font size. And that gives us 60 rem. So now we know that when we hit 60 rem, we want to collapse down to a single column layout. So we just copy this last media query, speed things along a little bit. And now we'll change that to 60 rem. Now we're going to target both of our columns. So we we'll add in both their classes. And you remember from our alignment lesson that the reason we have these two columns is we're floating them. We're floating one to the left and one to the right. So now we're going to override that floating behavior by setting float to none. So now that will remove that floating behavior. So our side is now down the bottom and our section is at the top. But obviously right now the columns are too thin, so we're going to fix that by changing the width of both of them to 100%. All right, so now our top section looks right and our side section almost looks right. It's still not quite there though because we still have this padding on the left. So we're going to make a new style to apply just to our second column. And here we're going to get rid of that padding on the left by adding padding left zero. All right, so now that looks a lot better. But now we have far too small a gap in between the section and the aside. You can't tell that they're two separate pieces of content. So to remedy that, we're gonna add some padding to the top of our aside. So we'll add padding top and we'll set that to four rem. 
All right, so now our single column layout is looking really good. Now we're going to check to see that everything looks good in between this width and our full width. And I think that right now, as we start coming down to the breakpoint where we go to a single column, we probably have a little bit too much spacing in our layout. So now we're going to gradually shrink the spacing down in between this point right before we collapse to a single column layout and this point, which is our widest point with our layout. So we're going to take the amount of padding that we're using down by 0.5 rems every 5 rem of width. So first, let's put in our media query at 80 rem. So we'll just copy and paste, makes it a little quicker. We'll change that to 80 rem. Now, we're going to reduce the padding inside the wrapper first. So we'll add in a new style for our wrapper. And then we'll set padding down from 5 rem to 4.5 rem. And then we'll also need to set the padding in between the columns to the same amount. So we'll add a new col underscore zero two style. And in there, we'll set padding left to 4.5 rem. Now we're going to repeat this a couple of times. So we'll just copy and paste. Change the media query here to 75. We'll drop this by 0.5 rem. So we have four rem for each. Copy and paste again. Change this down to 70 rem. And change our spacing amount to 3.5. And then one more time. We'll change that to 65 rem. And we'll change the spacing down to 3 rem. So now, when we start at our wider layout, you'll see the spacing gradually increase as we get thinner and thinner. So that's just very smooth and allows us to take better advantage of the available space as our layout becomes thinner. Now you'll notice that when we're back down to our single column layout, the spacing has reduced down again. And that's because the last media query that set padding on our wrapper was this one. And in this media query, we told the browser to apply this padding at any width up to 65 rem. So now to bring that back up again, in our 60 rem media query, where we're crunching down to a single column layout, we're going to add another wrapper class and we're going to bring the padding back up by copying this wrapper style. And now we'll just change that to four. And then let's put our padding back up again. But we still want to keep gradually shrinking it as we get smaller and smaller from here again. So now we'll add another media query. This time it'll be at 55 rem. And we'll drop the padding down to 3.5. We'll have another one at 45 rem. And we'll drop it down to 3. And then the last one will be at 35 rem and we'll drop it down to 2.5. So now we have a smoothly decreasing amount of spacing in our two column layout. And then we do the same thing again in a single column layout as the viewport gets smaller and there's less space to work with. And then on top of that, to help us maximize the space that we have available, we're going to remove the body padding that we added to create this spacing on the left and right of our wrapper. And we'll do that when we're really starting to get quite a small amount of space to work with at the 45 rem breakpoint. So in here, we'll add our body selector and we'll set the padding back to zero. So now we've almost handled everything that we need to. Things are looking pretty good. Our layout is responding well and it's handling the change in viewport size well. However, as we get smaller right now, the text is really, it's just a little bit too chunky. It's just a little bit too big and unwieldy for this amount of space. So what we're gonna do is tweak the text. Now, if you remember from our course on typography, we briefly touched on the VW unit, which allows you to size things based on the viewport width. And combining the VW unit with media queries can really simplify the process of creating responsive text. So up in our, 60 rem media query, we're going to add an H1 selector and in it we're going to set the font size 
to 5.6 VW. So that is 5.6% of the viewport width. Then we'll also add an H2 selector. And in this, we'll set the font size to 3.9 VW. Now let's look at the effect. When we reach 60 rem, which is when we go into our single column layout, now, instead of being a fixed size, our text is relative to the width of the viewport. So as we shrink our viewport down, you'll see the size of the text shrinking too. So that way you never end up with text that is too large for the window. So that's almost perfect for our text, but it does get a little bit too small at the smallest width. We don't want any of our headings to become smaller than the main text. And we still want our main headlines to look pretty significant. So at the 45 rem media query, we're still going to use the VW unit on our headings, but we're going to increase them a little bit. So we'll actually just copy this code, paste it into our 45 rem breakpoint, and we'll change this to 6.5 for the H1 selector and 5 for the H2. So let's bump that up a little bit. And now when we hit the single column layout, we have a really nice text size, no matter what width we go to. And the same thing applies for our H3. We have a really nice smoothly decreasing text size that still keeps it large enough to be suitable for a heading. All right, so that's now all the CSS done that you need to have in place to convert your layout into a fully responsive layout but there's still one more step that you need to complete before this is properly responsive, and that is in your HTML. And sometimes on mobile devices, the system will try to help improve the legibility of a site by altering the zoom level or the width that a site will show up as. And we wanna make sure that that doesn't happen because we are fully catered for any possible width that our site might be viewed at. So we're gonna add a meta element into our head that will tell the browser it doesn't need to modify the width of the site or the scale or zoom level, it can just load it up as it is. And that meta tag looks like this. So we have the name attribute set to viewport. And then in the content attribute, we're saying the width of our site should just be set to whatever the width of the device is. And that our site's initial scale should be one. So that's a one-to-one -one zoom level. In other words, just load the site up as it is. So whenever you're working on a responsive design, if you check it on a mobile device and it doesn't look right, then make sure that you've remembered to add this meta tag into your head section. All right, now let's zoom this video out and take a look at what we've done. So as we shrink things down, you can see that we've got a really nice fluidly changing layout that keeps our content looking highly legible and readable and everything is adjusting no matter what size the viewport is. And you'll also notice that the logo and the image are both shrinking so neither one is ever too large for the space, and that's because of the max width that we applied to the image earlier on. All right, so that's it. You've now fully completed your layout. Please join me in the final video of this course. We're just gonna quickly recap everything that you've learned, and I'll let you know what you'll be learning in the next course when we move on to adding backgrounds and coloring to our site. So I'll see you in the final video. Hey, welcome to the final video in Start Here, Learn CSS Layout. You've now completed three out of the four courses in our Start Here series. So you've started from the absolute beginning and you've now gone all the way through to having a site with HTML that you understand, typography that you've hand coded, and now a layout that you've set up as well. You know what REM units are and why we use them in layout. You know how to control sizing with all the different width and height properties. You know how to control alignment using floating, clearing, and text aligning on block or inline elements. You know how to set up spacing using margin and padding. You also have worked with borders and the box sizing property. And then finally, you also know how to take a design and make it responsive by applying media queries, by adjusting your columns, your spacing, and your text sizing. So now that you're three quarters of the way through the Start Here series, you're also three quarters of the way through completing an entire website. Now in the next course, you're going to be learning about CSS backgrounds and coloring, and you're going to take the site that you've been working on so far, and you're going to turn it into this. So you'll be learning how to apply background colors and how to apply background images. You'll learn how to apply text colors, including link colors, 
You'll learn about applying border colors, about how to create shadow effects using CSS3. And then you'll also go through the process of how to apply the coloring and backgrounds that you see in this final design here. So I hope you're really enjoying the Start Here series and that you're looking forward to wrapping up the whole process in the final course, Learn CSS Colors and Backgrounds. So thanks again, and I'll see you in the next one.